most roads into London. Worst affected is the A40 at Hangar Lane, where the tailback is... <coughs> ...on the A516 in Derbyshire is causing severe congestion. It now seems certain that the world will face a serious oil shortage by the turn of the century. In the context of transportation alone, we must therefore seek to understand the real needs of the community. During the night has made driving difficult on roads throughout the northwest. Motorists are advised to leave their vehicles at home if at all possible. Seeing work on the northbound carriageway of the M1 between junctions 19 and 21 is causing a problem. There's already a five-mile tailback, and the police advise motorists to leave the motorway at junction 16 and follow the diversion signs. Or, of course, you could find an alternative route. The case for travelling by train is never more clearly established than when you're not travelling by train. Traffic jams, road repairs, broken down vehicles, bad weather. These can only contribute to the feeling that somewhere along the line, or rather away from the line, you've made the wrong choice. Add a few other factors like the sheer strain of driving and the frustration of looking for somewhere to park, and the train is on its own. Understandably, rail travel is popular in so many ways to so many people. It makes sense. Less understandable, then, is the fact that, as far as the government is concerned, Britain's railways are increasingly unpopular in terms of attracting sufficient investment to counter the charge that whole areas of the network are being allowed to fall into a state of neglect. Across the Channel, things are run differently. In France, in Germany, in many other European countries, more and more people are travelling by rail, making use of extensive, modernised rail systems, which are the result of positive action on the part of governments committed to improving train services. Sadly, in Britain, no government has ever faced up to the need for a comprehensive plan covering the transportation needs of the whole country. In consequence, improvements are little more than piecemeal and seemingly may never arrive for thousands of people waiting on the sidelines. Yet, if a modern, effective transport system is essential to the economic well-being of any country, how can we accept that in Britain, the railway system, with all its advantages, should continue to be run into a siding? Put simply, if we're not just playing with trains, if we're not just content to watch the argument for rail transport go round and round, surely it's important to consider the real worth of giving rail a future. The railway is part of Britain's heritage, a British invention which fired the imagination of the world. For more than 150 years, the railway network in Britain has developed in response to the growing needs of a nation caught up in the excitement of progress, of moving forward, of seeking some better way. But today, that network is diminishing, contracting, serving the community less well. Or perhaps serving it right but we seem to go along with the idea that what should be at the forefront of transport policy should merely function as an afterthought. And we seem to think that our continental neighbours, who are busily exploiting the immense potential of rail, are doing something that's now impossible here in Britain. Some of us, at any rate. Others, like the rail unions, believe fervently in a future for Britain's railways built on the basis of new technology. 
a rail system with advanced trains, improved rolling stock and redeveloped stations. In fact, a complete overhaul of the network, a system which is clean, economical, fast and safe, staffed by a skilled, confident workforce with a clear commitment to providing a first-rate service for passengers and freight customers. And this is no pie-in-the-sky fantasy. High-speed trains, low fares, a fast, pollution-free, electrified service. These options are available now. The key to this better railway is investment. Railways in West Germany and France have attracted three times the level of investment received by VR. And the improvements have been dramatic. The journey from Paris to Lyon, about the same as that from London to Newcastle, now takes hardly more than two hours, compared with more than three hours in Britain. There's one other important difference between investment in railways in this country and the rest of Europe. Since the mid-1970s, the pattern of investment in Britain is one of steady decline. Yet West Germany, Holland, Sweden and Switzerland are currently investing at a higher level in real terms than seven or eight years ago. And after a long period of high investment, investment in SNCF is only just below levels of the mid-1970s. As a leading authority on public transport has recently pointed out, Britain is now unique among industrialized countries in cutting investment in public transport. The fact that there has been no real attempt by any administration to sit down and evaluate the strengths of the various forms of transport to determine how they should coexist in the present day to the benefit of all is part and parcel of the problem we face. For with a firm commitment to invest in the rail service and integrate it with other means of mass transit, road, air, sea, we could achieve a transport infrastructure which would carry Britain into the 1990s and beyond. A heady vision. But can we afford it? Well, over the last 25 years, we've built 1,670 miles of motorways. A further 350 miles are either under construction or planned. For the cost of just 40 miles of those motorways, some 500 million pounds, we can travel a long way towards the rail system this country will need in the future. So why has that money not been available? Why are Britain's railways not worth 40 miles of motorway? Well, mainly because of the inability of successive governments to take a balanced view of road and rail transport. In effect, to treat them equally, and in so doing, to cost them on the same basis. For road transport exists with an inbuilt and hidden subsidy. According to government figures, spending on road building and maintenance last year was 2,600 million pounds. It cost another 300 million pounds to administer that system. On the other hand, the cost to the taxpayer of operating our railways is about 900 million pounds a year. Most of this is payment by government to cover the cost of the social railway. But wait a minute. British Rail is expected not only to pay for its own capital investment, but also to make a profit. There is no British Roads Board to draw up an annual balance sheet. Yet if the real costs of rail and roads were to be compared, we would have to include not only the £2,900 million spent on building and maintaining our roads, but other costs imposed by the traveller on other members of the community, the social costs of roads. For example, road accidents now cost a staggering £2,370 million a year. Subsidy to company car users through non-payment of tax has been calculated at £1,400 million a year. And what about the cost of air pollution and noise, the cost of congestion and the wasteful use of energy? Recent studies have found that if subsidies and all social costs of rail and private road passenger transport are compared, railways cost the community 19 pence per passenger mile, while road costs the community 22 pence. A very different story, you might think, from the one recited by the Rail Must Fail Brigade. And it's worth repeating. For while no government has ever required the road system to pay its way and make a profit, successive governments have decreed that British Rail must do just that. 
which means in practice that the nation is deprived of hundreds of miles of vital rail links because the money won't stretch that far. Consider the parallel argument that roads should be closed because they're not being used enough during a recession. In fact, every country lane, even if it leads to just one farmhouse, is kept open and maintained. Now, no one's suggesting that underused roads should be allowed to sink into the mud. But doesn't the mere idea reflect the double standards of those politicians who happily support the decline of the rail network on grounds of cost? And if it's important to maintain the link to far-flung communities in all weathers, isn't it equally important that, as well as roads, our railways should serve the people who depend on the train as their main means of travel? So in terms of rural and suburban services, as well as in terms of intercity speed and efficiency, it can only be sensible that we prepare now to meet the social and industrial transportation requirements of the country. Certainly, the approval of the East Coast Main Line electrification scheme is a major step forward. But what is needed is a long-term rolling program of nationwide electrification. And if the industry cannot be expected to fund such a program, the money should certainly not come from more and more cutbacks and job losses. Basically, the rail unions believe we should be thinking along the following lines. That we should invest in a modern electrified rail system. That we should design and build new rolling stock. That new stations should be built to serve growing communities. That existing stations should be improved and new passenger information systems introduced and that more people should be encouraged to use the railways and other forms of public transport as the result of an overall cheap fares policy. Let's examine those options. For a start, the electrification of rail routes throughout the country can only bring in its wake faster, cleaner trains and reduce our dependence on oil. But investment in electrification will not only improve the service offered by British Rail and stimulate the passenger and freight markets, it will give Britain a real transport alternative and the construction industry confidence in its future. Where, though, are the new trains to match the move out of piecemeal planning? Quite simply, they could be produced here in Britain by British Rail Engineering. BREL has the engineering skill to re-equip the network and manufacture sophisticated rolling stock. And this again is no pie-in-the-sky dream, for BREL has an outstanding international reputation and is only awaiting the green light at home. We in Britain are proud to lead the world in many ways. We should not be proud of our lead in cutting investment in public transport. In short, our railways are being deprived of the support they need to provide people with an efficient service, a service they deserve. The decision to neglect our rail network would simply cause it to die, and the effect of such indifference on the industrial life of this country would be devastating. It's easy to forget that the railways carry not only passengers, but also a large proportion of Britain's bulk freight traffic. For example, British Rail normally moves on average about one and a half million tonnes of coal to power stations every week. And shifting this mountain of essential fuel by road would require 10,000 heavy lorries every week to supply no more than one power station. Just consider the damage caused to the environment and the huge strain placed on our road system by this amount of extra traffic, not to mention the woeful inefficiency. Turning the argument the other way, the Department of Transport predict that if things continue as they are, there will be an increase of 45,000 juggernauts on our roads by 1990. Doesn't that underline the fact that railways are the only sane way of transporting container, bulk and general freight? This area has vast potential for growth, if only we invest in its future now. Again, we can learn from the rest of Europe. While in Britain we have about 1,500 private rail freight sidings, France has nearly 11,000, and West Germany over 15,000. 
But what of the present? To cut the cost of running the rail system, we are cutting commuter services all over the country. We're tearing up good track and cannibalizing reserve lines. And accepting that this should happen is to accept a deterioration in overall operating standards, which in the long run could lead to real doubts about general safety. Not a happy picture, but it could be. For in providing investment to give rail a future, we provide passengers and freight customers with a reason to make that future work. Good trains, good stations, good facilities, and cheap fares. It's an unbeatable combination. And we know that a cheap fares policy works. When London Transport reduced its fares substantially in 1983, the number of passengers it carried increased by as much as 16%, and road users experienced less congestion. Other transport authorities in Britain report similar results. In the rest of Europe, too, low fares are central to national transportation policies and command all party support. What's more, rather than hindering the development of a more efficient, cost-effective service, low fares have stimulated demand to the extent of producing a greater total revenue than the higher and higher fares policy operating in Britain. A fanciful claim? Well, let's look at the situation in France again. Low fares policies there have resulted in an increase in passenger traffic of 35%, while in Sweden the increase is as much as 73%. All over Europe, large numbers of people are moving towards rail travel. European governments have invested in the future, and the people have responded. Couldn't the same be true in Britain? Isn't it probable that a large-scale, high-speed, electrified railway, operating an efficient, low-fare passenger service, and an effective freight business, will produce both a return on investment and more jobs? So. Railways provide a social service in many isolated communities. Cities need railways to avoid ever-worsening road congestion. Freight and bulk commodities are most efficiently and safely moved by rail. Increasing the size and number of lorries on the roads cannot be the answer. If we don't invest in rail now, the system can only deteriorate beyond repair. The unions are always being accused of burying their heads in the sand. You'll agree that that's hardly true in this case. Perhaps they're more aware than anyone of the problems which face the railway industry, the dangers of neglect and complacency, of lack of investment and foresight. Essentially, Britain needs a better railway system now, a system built on cooperation and understanding, a system to be proud of, and which serves our society to the full. Doesn't the act of giving rail a future make sense?